Unfortunately, we're still dealing with a heart disease epidemic that outweighs all other epidemics. These are 2020 data. We're waiting for 2021 from our Center for Disease Control, but I assume in the United States are going to be similar. And you can see for, in fact, in 2020, for 102 years in a row, the number one cause of death in America has been heart disease, uh, followed by closely by cancer deaths cumulatively, and then a new third place cause of death in 2020. And that was, of course, the corona SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, we'll see what 2021 numbers, but heart disease will again be number one. We got a lot of work to do and genetics and lifestyle, and we're learning tremendous amounts about both. But we're going to talk about practical issues and the science behind them today. Just to remind you, we all walk around with three or four coronary arteries, heart arteries. They have names. They can be seen on CAT scans, on catheterization, on advanced imaging studies. And they have this terrible tendency to block up, you know, uh, some species just won't block up like a dog heart arteries, but we have different physiology. We're much more herbivore than carnivore like a dog. And as you can see here, there's a blockage caused by hard calcified cholesterol and blood cells and only a small little open space. And that's what we're going to talk about. How do you interpret the science, plan your life and use particularly food as a medicine? in an ever-changing world of data, and can't possibly talk about every new piece of data, but we'll talk about enough that I think it'll leave you satisfied. So I wanna go through the basic foundation of why in my practice, I tell patients cardiovascular disease, heart disease, atherosclerosis is reversible. And of course, if you're not familiar with that book cover, that's 1990, a uh, hard cover and a soft cover. I have the paperback in my office. New York Times bestseller, Dr. Dean Ornish's program for reversing heart disease. And there have been many wonderful books by Mr. Nathan Pritikin, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, and others on the topic. But we have at least 32 years of uh, material that the public could easily read on this topic. So we have reason to believe heart disease is reversible. And those are some famous coronary angiograms before and after that surround the book. And also why no oil diets as the basis in these heart disease reversal programs? And does that mean you also should have a no oil diet, even if you're not aware that you're dealing with a heart disease reversal situation? You could assume that you're at risk for coronary heart disease because you are, and everybody is to a different degree, but all of us are to some degree, but you need to pattern your life after the historical landmarks that led us to conclude heart disease is reversible using nutrition. Familiar graph to some of you, maybe not all of you, but what sparked a number of people's scientific interest was right after World War II, data came out that countries in Europe, for example, this is Norway, that suffered through the food a desert of World War II and many other atrocities, of course, actually had a rate of death in their countries, not due to war, but just due to the general causes that dropped. And when this was studied scientifically, the fact that there was difficulty obtaining the richer foods, the meat, the fowl, the eggs, the full fat dairy like cheeses were all much less accessible. There was a shift to growing your own food, eating in the forest and gardens and heart disease risk and death rates actually dropped only to rebound once the economy started to recover and normal uh, production of food. And I say normal in quotations, traditional, uh, started to rebound, then heart disease started to rebound. Simultaneous with this, we'll see in a few minutes, was a rise in heart attacks above the baseline in the United States after World War II. Times were good, soldiers were smoking, Women were working, uh, restaurants were uh, expanding, uh, processed foods in the grocery store were available and heart attacks started to really increase. And people asked the question, why? And what can we do about it? 
So there were some early researchers that were trying to connect if diet and health, the changing Western world diet, uh, the, the negative impacts of what occurred in Norway in terms of their diet, but the positive uh, reductions in death, and the United States a flip-flop, the rich diet with reduced health. And I won't go into Walter Kempner. Many of you have heard of him through a series of videos on nutritionfacts.org, but a fascinating researcher. That is not Lester Morrison's picture. They can't find a good picture, but he was a professor in Los Angeles. I'll tell you about in a minute. Ansel Keys is there right above 1960. We'll talk about him and Mr. Pritikin and such. But I want to point out to you, and this raises the question, is heart disease reversible and why no oil diets have been the research diet? But a paper published in 1951, and I told you we'd take it back 70, 71 years, reduction of mortality in coronary disease by a low cholesterol, low fat diet. This was a famous Los Angeles doctor, Lester Morrison, MD. Not so famous nowadays, but he was pretty well known in Los Angeles who had a very large practice. And in the late forties, there was very little to offer heart patients. There was first bypass surgery was 1969. The first angioplasty was 1977. The first statins were in the late 1980s. Uh, aspirin was recognized as an agent and not much more than that. So he took a hundred patients from his clinic who had had a heart attack, an infarction, and he gave them a diet sheet. The diet sheet was a low cholesterol, low fat diet. I'll show you in a minute. Or the other group, he said, just keep on eating the way you're eating. He didn't know what would happen. After three years, the test group lost weight. And it's rather remarkable what the average weight of men and women in Los Angeles were at the time, because uh, it's not the same now. It's much higher now. Cholesterol fell without prescription drugs, because there weren't any, from 312 to 220. And just to recognize that you can have an average cholesterol of 312 in 100 patients in Los Angeles who had a prior heart attack indicates to some degree how uh, off balance the standard diet was after World War II with drive-ins and burgers and fries and malts and milkshakes. And people that adopted that diet described feeling better, uh, more exercise tolerance and less cardiac symptoms like angina. A breakthrough study, it was randomized. Of course, it wasn't blinded. Uh, the 50 in one group knew what they were eating and the 50 in the other group knew what they were eating. So this is Dr. Morrison's famous handout. And unfortunately, he's no longer alive. And we can't ask him exactly why he picked these foods. But I want you to go predominantly to the last line. He advised 50 of the 100 to avoid gravies, okay, but to avoid olives, nuts, and avocados. And if you look just above it, he also advised avoiding olive or vegetable oils. And there had been some basis. And, you know, generally, he just developed a low fat, low cholesterol diet plan. But particularly in California, the home of avocados, uh, in, in terms of the American production, uh, it's still unclear why he picked these foods, but he did. And they became famous as potentially worth avoiding for heart disease reversal programs. If you've never seen the results of his studies published, at the end of 12 years, most dramatically, the group that was in the low fat, low cholesterol diet handout section, the 50 of the 100, about half of them were still alive. Heart disease is a serious disease, but half were alive. None of the control group was still alive 12 years later. Advanced heart disease in the 1950s, prior heart attack in the 1950s, had a very serious lethality. We're doing much better than that uh, with current approaches, but it still can be a lethal disease, of course, as we saw. It's still number one overall, cardiovascular disease. So Dr. Morrison did show that a low-fat, low-cholesterol diet had an impact, but we're not completely clear why he picked no olives, no avocados. These are not processed foods. Along came Nathan Pritikin, an engineer from Santa Barbara with an extremely bright mind, aerospace engineer. He learned about cholesterol as a blood test, had his cholesterol checked. It was sky high. He loved hot dogs. He loved ice cream. He was, in fact, a patient of Dr. Lester Morrison. And Dr. Morrison told him, 
here's a handout on what I do with my practice. And you're going to be in real trouble if you don't make some changes, young man, because Mr. Pritikin was about 40 at the time. And as anybody who's studied his biography, which is a wonderful read, or any of his books, which became multi-million bestsellers and appearances on 60 Minutes and actual scientific publications that involve thousands of patients, because he started teaching people what he learned, and he got medical doctors around him and taught them too, and they became the group that gave him uh, medical authority to publish papers, MDs that were in his clinic. He opened a treatment clinic in Santa Barbara, moved it to Santa Monica, and it still exists all these years later in Miami at the Doral Country Club, the Pritikin Longevity Center. So he would publish papers like this. This is back 31 years ago, and it's not Dr. Neil Barnard. It's another Dr. Barnard down below as the first author. But they would take patients for three weeks. They would have them do exercise. Many of them could barely walk. Some of you know Michael Greger, MD, and his grandmother were part of this program. They could barely walk. They put them on a low-fat, low-cholesterol plant, uh, almost exclusive diet. It wasn't 100% plant diet option. Uh, the number of calories from fat were quite low. They had men and women, they saw just in three weeks, significant drops in cholesterol, LDL, triglycerides, HDL, body weight. And they did identify that people were uh, enjoying a quality of life and objective measures of heart disease at all significantly advanced just with introducing in a three week inpatient program in a hotel setting in Santa Barbara and Santa Monica. Along came Dr. Ornish. Was he going to follow the same plant-based, low-fat approach of Dr. Morrison and Mr. Pritikin? And, and Dr. Ornish did indeed select, if you look at his dietary pyramid, that if you look at the very top of the pyramid, fats less than 10% of calories. It was, again, a low-cholesterol, uh, low-fat diet, largely of vegetables, fruits, legumes, and whole grains. If you look at the lower right, this were studies starting in the uh, late 1970s when Dr. Ornish was a very young medical student and resident. He chose to exclude all oils, meats, olives, avocados, nuts, and seeds. He has, as many of you know, made some changes to the program since, particularly in terms of nuts and seeds. But it always was a lifestyle program, including exercise, stress reduction, smoking cessation, group support yoga, meditation, but again, oils off the list, olives off the list, avocados off the list. And that was, uh, again, research starting in the late 1970s. His first publication was 1979. And the first full article of the randomized study was 1990. And indeed, I had just started practice in 1990 and I read his original article. This is the 1998 follow-up. Asking the question, can an intensive lifestyle program over one year and then five years actually reduce the amount of plaque in heart arteries of heart patients? And some of you have seen this slide, but for those of you that haven't or need to see it again, it may be the most famous plant-based reversal outcome data ever published, even though this was uh, 1998 uh, and we got a lot of years since. But if you look to the left baseline, there were two groups of heart patients. They had cardiac catheterization and geography. On average, they were 41% narrowed across their three or four major heart arteries. They were either put on this intensive lifestyle program or control, controls in the black circles. The intensive lifestyle treatment of using whole foods, low in fat, were on the white uh, squares. And the amount of narrowing went up, and then it really went up in five years because these people underwent another catheterization for research purposes twice. But you can see that the average amount of narrowing, in medical terminology, stenosis means narrowing. The average amount of narrowing actually went down in one year and five years on the whole food plant-based lifestyle program that was low in fats. And this was dramatic data that using food and lifestyle, this was before prescription drugs were widely available and common before statins. Dr. Ornish did allow his patients to eat 
uh, access to egg whites and non-fat dairy because at the time uh, he was concerned if these people could support their nutrition with just fruits and vegetables. It was early in the game. He also used omega-3 fatty acids from fish because one of his advisors, Dr. Alexander Leaf, had advised him that it might be challenging for these people on the plant diet to get enough omega-3. Now we depend more on chia, flax, hemp, and algal supplements if needed. But at the time, that's what he used. So it was a nearly completely plant-based approach. 